So why don't we just do some quick introductions just so I can uh, let you guys know who's with me today. So I'm Ryan Bodkin. I'm, you guys all met me at CORD. Um, I'm from Rochester. I'm the program director here. And guide us through this uh, marketing conversation. I'm going to let him do a brief introduction of who he is and what he does. And um, then we'll kind of move on with the conversation. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Mike, and I uh, am the co-founder and uh, of Giant Propeller, which is a digital agency, digital marketing marketing agency, and we specialize in helping emerging brands grow their brands and manage successful campaigns for them online. Excellent. All right. So the way that we kind of structured this is my uh, self and Mike talked a number of times. And I basically told him kind of from a emergency medicine residency and emergency medicine academic standpoint, what types of things I would be interested from a marketing standpoint, what types of questions I had, what types of content I thought was uh, important. And um, me and Mike came up with this uh, presentation together and he's gonna kind of walk you through it and I'm gonna add additional things. So if we're all ready, we can kind of get started. Mike, you ready to go? Yeah, let's do this. Great. So. Um, I'm not sure how much everybody, you know, knows about marketing. So um, forgive me, uh, you know, feel free to stop me at any point and ask any questions. Um, I'm going to try to keep this pretty high level. We'll go into some details as we go along, drill into some more sort of specific things. But don't hesitate to stop me as we're going along. I'm going to kind of walk through this as an overview, covering brand strategy, um, first and foremost, which is the you know, most important thing, uh, you know, who are you and identifying yourself. Then we'll go into content creation and what that really looks like and sort of all the different methodologies about content creation and uh, you know options that are out there for that in sort of displaying your brand to viewers and um, potential uh, residents, so on and so forth. And then how we leverage the data that we create, uh, uh, how we leverage the, uh, the creation of those materials and the data that comes along with that once we start Distributing that to uh, all of the all of the people um, online um, throughout the, uh, the the World Wide Web. So first, I want to jump into brand strategy. Um, the important part here uh, in in any brand that, that, that that's being created. Um, in your case, you know um, all of your different medical uh, institutions um, is defining who you guys are, um, and by that. Uh, you know, it, it's really the, the task of the marketing team um, to come up with what we call your USP or unique selling proposition. Um, what that is, is uh, coming up with the definition of what particularly defines you as unique. Now, that can sometimes be a challenge, um, especially with, with, you know, similar attributes, you know, everybody may be in this case being in the, the medical industry, but you, you, uh, the, the task and the goal is to really kind of dig deep and find out what sort of separates your institution from your competitor's institution. Um, and on the surface level, it might be the same, but, um, you know, asking yourself questions like, um, you know, how are facilities different than other people's facilities? Um, what do we offer that other people don't offer? Um, you know, we have a lot of alumni that have done this particular thing or that particular thing. Uh, it could be the weather, you know, the weather of uh, the climate of, our, of, of where we're located. Uh, so really digging deep because you have to define yourself and stand out from everyone else um, and figure out how to sell yourself as that brand, as an institution. Um, so take the time to really figure that out. It's really the foundation of everything that goes into marketing um, and, so that you can make sure that you are, you know, talking and speaking the right way about your brand and focusing on the right candidates. Yeah, so we all um, do, you know, emergency medicine, like Mike's saying, but we all have something unique about us. Are you a powerhouse ultrasound institution? Are you an institution that thrives on social justice? Are you an institution that has an incredible diverse patient population. Is there something unique or different about you that's not just academic emergency medicine that can make you stand out from others? Great. Um, 
the next part um, after you guys you know you know talk about that at length and figure that out um, is defining your audience. Um, the ultimate goal of, of marketing is reaching the right people, you know, and depending on what your objectives and your goals are, you, you have to figure out um, and what any brand um, essentially needs to figure out is who are they supposed to be speaking to. Um, so um, defining your audience becomes a real key um, component to uh, an overall marketing strategy. The first thing um, is really, I would say, looking at who your current team members are. Who are the residents? Um, you know, what's the ethnicity makeup of that those those residents? You know, what's the demographic? What's their what are their set how's their sex breakdown? Their ages, etc. Um, learning about who your current base is, is is super important in taking next next steps to figure out who your ideal candidates are going to be. Um, and, 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 and figuring that out, you've got to really, really understand your audience. You know, um, like Ryan was saying, you know, you, you guys all focus partic on particular things maybe. So um, what about those things, you know, are, is attractive to the people that you guys want to target to bring into your institution? Um, what we do uh, and what, what's, what's, a, what's common practice in marketing and, and selling things, um, is is a process called persona building and what that is is leveraging you know any of this internal data that you guys might have um, on your current you know on former former classes former residents former people that have gone through all your alumni um, and also leveraging you know some third-party data uh, that's out there as well just to really figure out um, who uh, do you want to target and bring into your program um, you know and 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 there's a Tons of different personas that can come out of that. We usually like to target about three to five. Uh, uh, the objective of all of this is, you know, obviously when we go into, you know, advertising, which is another component to this, is you got to know who you're going to be speaking to and how you're going to reach those people. So you might, you know, do your, uh, you know, your execution of these personas and find out that, you know, you guys, one of your personas is. Uh, young Indian males from the Midwest that like online esports, you know, uh, it could be that detailed. Or mothers with, you know, a previous employment history who have an ill parent um, and they have to take care of that that person. So the point of these are not to be very vanilla and bland. The point is to be very specific and detailed to really, really narrow in on the nuances of who that could be. Um, it's important that everybody gets on the same page and that you guys are utilizing your efforts towards that. So that's persona building. Um, let's see, next. Um, the, the, thing, the thing about marketing after you sort of start to build your brand and understand you know, who, your, who your targets are, uh, what, you're, what you're going after, um, you have to figure out what, what your goal is now. Um, and by goal meaning, what, what is the execution of the marketing and what are you guys trying to, to do with the marketing of your institution? And there's several different ways that marketing can get sort of broken down in, into, the, into several different buckets. Um, you know, awareness is one of them. Uh, you might be looking for, you know, awareness meaning um, you're trying to let people know that you exist and that you are out there. Um, and that is really uh, an early stage of what we call the marketing funnel. It's, it's letting people know that you exist. Um, then you have something like lead generation um, campaigns and marketing. And that, what that means is you guys are really targeting to bring people into your institution and start talking to them more specifically about the intricacies or the details that you guys have laid out um, that your institution is focusing on um, from that USP and from that from that brand standpoint. Um, the other thing that you guys can be looking at too is uh, something like performance. And performance really has to do with how you're generating revenue. Um, how does a marketing dollar in mean a marketing dollar? Uh, 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 sorry, a marketing dollar out mean marketing uh, revenue coming back in to the to the institution. Um, so those are real three sort of big buckets 
that marketing and marketers really look to go after and and target. So if you guys look at this from a you know a residency perspective, we all just went through recruitment season, are making our rank list now and things like that. You can think of awareness as as early as MS1 and MS2 medical students that might be interested in emergency medicine, or even as far back as high school students that may be interested in emergency medicine already and are thinking of coming to medical school to pursue emergency medicine. So it can go pretty far back. Your you know your lead generation is the people we're currently recruiting. So MS4 students interested in going to emergency medicine that we are actively trying to recruit into our positions. And then alumni makes a lot of sense for us. Our people that are out there um, that trained at the University of Rochester that are out there speaking our name, publishing your name, and, and doing great things that can give us more kind of validity to what we do. Great. Oops. Uh, okay. There we go. You good? Great. So, um, so now that you have, you know, your your sort of marketing goal uh, in mind, then you have to figure out how you guys are going to execute that stuff. And there's a lot of different ways to distribute those things. Um, uh, digital marketing, which is you know what what uh, what we um, as a company primarily focus on, you know anything that's happening online, you know all all social networks, anything that kind of touches computers, tablets, uh, digital displays, things like that. Um, and then you have out of home, which is really the more traditional approach to marketing, which you guys see all of the time: billboards, uh, comp, you know marketing collateral for conferences, uh, you know pamphlets, flyers. Uh, Building wraps, you know, uh, taxi cabs, uh, uh, you know, bus wraps, all of that stuff that you see uh, outside of your home as you're sort of living your daily life. So um, once you understand what your goals are, what your campaigns are, you kind of start to, to sort of disseminate, you know, how you guys uh, are then going to distribute, um, you know, within those campaigns into into public facing, um, into the marketing atmosphere. Um, Competition analysis uh, is another big part of this this uh, this brand strategy and branding. Um, what you guys are looking at too, um, when you're kind of going through these steps from a, a USP standpoint, um, unique selling proposition standpoint, learning about your personas is also figuring out who your main competition is, and that's that's a, certainly a very helpful component to to marketing because you understand what people um, are doing. Uh, on, on the other side of the fence um, in regards to uh, how other institutions that, you know, if, if you're in Rochester and competing with, with Albany, you know, how Albany is doing their stuff and understanding, understanding all that. Um, what are they doing better? Um, how, how, how are they handling their, their marketing initiatives um, in a way that you guys think are, are really useful? Um, and just understanding overall um, how you guys can then leverage that information from a competition standpoint and potentially do it better yourselves. So all of that stuff, uh, I know it was quick, but that is is really the focus um, you know, of a foundation from a brand strategy standpoint. Understanding who you guys are, uh, defining who your audience is uh, going to be, what your goals are from a, from a marketing standpoint, how you guys are going to um, you know, approach to those those people, um, and also what other people are doing. And once you guys have all that sort of figured out on on the baseline from a strategy standpoint, um, then we move into content creation. Um, content creation uh, ultimately becomes what are the things you guys are going to make um, and show so that those people and that foundation that you built gets the messaging that you want them to get to find interest and start bringing them into the institution, all these channels, you know, making them aware of you. What are you guys saying to them? Um, if you guys are do, targeting these, these MS1 and MS2 people, what do you guys want them to know about, about your institution? Um, if you're bringing them in from the MS3 and MS4 and the lead generation, what what detail do you guys give, give them to make sure that they're, that they're committing to you guys over somebody else? Um, and then same thing on the alumni. Um, how are you guys, you know, interacting with alumni and giving them information on what's been happening at the program? So there's a lot of ways to sort of go about uh, content and, and its creation. Um, and I just want to dig a little bit deeper into that, that, that next step. Um, so um, you really, you have to ask yourself, what do you guys need um, to achieve your goal? Um, and I would say based on 
um, what you guys are all doing in, in your profession, um, really the foundation becomes obviously a very strong executive team. And obviously um, that has nothing to do with marketing, but marketing that concept is going to be the core of that because if people are coming to your institutions to learn about um, why you're better than the next one, um, you know, making sure that you guys show those people off in a way and have them, you know, front facing is extremely, extremely important um, from a marketing standpoint. You guys want to be the thought leaders on a certain thing. Uh, you guys want to show that you're you have the most information in an educational environment. Um, that becomes sort of the foundation from a content perspective. And, and that could be, you know, just as simple as highlighting that on your website, where I'm, I'm sure lots of your, your traffic comes from when people are trying to educate themselves. Um, make sure that you have, you know, have the best of the best when, when it comes to that. Um, you, need, uh, you need to have that strong leadership and executive team in place and on view for everyone. Um, we, see this, and, you know, we see this all the time. Um, you know, you think about someone like Awa Matu or someone like Esther Chu. Everybody knows where these people work. Um, there's blogs and podcasts and all sorts of information out there about them. And they are out in the forefront um, because people want to go work with them because they are the best of the best at what they're doing. Um, so putting those people and having people of high quality expertise, showing them off and showing what they do to prospective people um, is a great way to, to gain audience um, participation in, in what you guys are trying to accomplish in, in recruiting them to your programs. Yeah, that that's that's great, Ryan. And 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 um, one of the one of the first things that you guys should all be looking at is, um, and, and I kind of touched on this briefly, is is what your website looks like. I mean, um, digital traffic and information gathering, as we all know, is all done uh, online these days. And um, making sure that you guys have, excuse me, a website that looks professional. Um, that speaks properly to your target audience, um, that has the right messaging, um, that shows that executive team is first and foremost the single most important thing that you guys can do. You are an institution of education and you have to be able to sell that in a very quick glance because people bounce off websites all the time, but in this case, um, people don't just go to uh, a medical uh, institution just for fun to check something out. They're going to go there and look around and read and be informed about things. It is the first point of contact, and the first point of contact is single-handedly the most important thing. So from a content perspective, making sure your website is top-notch is, uh, is very, very important. And I'm not saying top-notch in the sense that it's a super cool website with a lot of awesome bells and whistles. Uh, more so in the messaging, the look, and the way that people can navigate through it. It doesn't give a low-end feel. It gives a very high-end, polished feel to the institution. Um, in addition to that, uh, obviously, there's there's the PR aspect from content. Wait, let me just comment on one thing about websites. Um, a lot of you that work in you know big academic institutions, there are a ton of roadblocks to this. This is not an easy thing to do. To put what you want on your website goes through a million different uh, red tapes, red flags. You can't do this, you can't do that. We use this system, we use this format. Um, but you have to push against that and push back. And it can take a long time to find the right people in the institution that can actually make change to your website. It's impressive how challenging this is. And this is something I've faced for the last couple of years at my institution. It's something that we're, we're making some good strides on now. But it's taken a long time to find the right people to make that change, but you need to kind of push through this to get your website the way it looks and the way you want it to look to deliver the information you need. Um, but this is way harder done than actually said. Um, the other thing that is important for everybody to be aware of is PR and public relations. Um, and, and, and on a again, from a from a content perspective, um, obviously I think we all are, are aware what PR is. Um, but there are, you know, there are important parts about PR that I know specifically, not being in medicine, that you guys should be aware of, um, like, you know, content online um, that mentions your institutions. Um, you know, for example, I can tell you, you know, there's that, I, I believe it's US World Report that publishes the best schools in the country. Um, uh, you know, 
things like that. Uh, there are lists that you guys can get on that you can become a part of with the proper PR agency to make sure that your institution's name is getting mentioned in all of those publications. Um, you know, it is a pay to play situation. Um, not all of those things are done uh, independently. Um, people certainly can leverage their, their PR contacts um, with the right, you know, with the right abilities to make sure that they're getting placed properly um, on, you know, whatever high ranking list that, that needs to be put on there. Um, this really comes into play from a PR perspective online when, you know, people are typing in what's the best medical school, uh, what's the best institution for this or that. Um, getting your name out there on the internet is extremely important because what, what happens is, for example, everybody knows Google, right? Google has an algorithm that scans the internet all of the time and the more things get mentioned, it's called backlinking, the more uh, the ranking power that it gets. So um, having that, uh, that PR component to things and making sure your name is mentioned with obviously not only things like the best institution, but getting your name out there for, you know, content articles about um, very important things uh, is always extremely, extremely helpful in building that, uh, that thought leadership and uh, stature when it comes to your institutions um, like, you know, other things, you know, white papers uh, and, and blogs, uh, anything that speaks at that level is beneficial for anybody that's reading it, obviously, but also from a ranking perspective um, digitally so that you are moving through the Google algorithms properly. And we all see this every day. We know who the EMRAP people are. We know where they work. The students know where they work. People want to go and train with them because they're thought leaders um, and they have these incredible, um, you know, outreach as far as their content that they're producing and the, and the numbers of people that they're reaching with this outstanding content, which makes them known in the EM institution and in, in the EM world. Yeah, that, that's that's great. And um, the next thing I, I wanted to talk about, uh, yeah, and Ryan, sorry, if you go back one slide, you also have those. Um, the headphones on same thing we didn't really talk about that i think you mentioned it earlier but you know podcasts um things like that just just circulating your name however however digitally or, or off from, from an audio perspective um video and photo production um is the next thing i wanted to talk about the visual side of things uh you know having high quality uh visual work um obviously you know when people are looking at things you can tell the difference between uh, something that was put together on from an amateur level and something that was put together from a professional level. And people are used to seeing that high-end uh, and polished look. Uh, having lots of videos, having lots of photos, covering the right things, um, coming up with a story that you guys want to tell about yourselves um, um, becomes very, very important. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways for people to make photos uh, and videos uh, that don't have to be always that, that traditional. You can be doing high quality photos for your websites, for your social media channels, um, for your publications, for your out of home campaigns, you know, of, of doctors doing things with patients and so on and so forth, uh, which is a great, a great route to go. Um, you know, using, you know, your, your own doctors or obviously you can hire, you know, staged actors and, and whatnot, but just having having the ability to show that you are a high quality institution um, really comes along with a visual aesthetic. Um, on, on, the, on the video side, same thing, you know, doing interviews with your, your team about certain things, uh, you know, having them speak on an educational level about you know, again, how a surgery may happen, uh, you know, the intricacies of, of those things. Um, but the, the real thing about video and photo production is that um, there, there's, there's obviously evergreen material that you guys want to live on forever um, in an informational way. But because content is consumed so frequently these days, having stuff done on a regular basis is a very good content strategy. It's probably not something that a lot of people, other medical institutions do. Um, but again, if you're trying to attract the right people and you guys really want to, you know, get in on that baseline awareness level, you know, early on in people's careers uh, or, or, or uh, educations, um, then 
you can really start thinking about how you might do that. How do you get somebody to notice you guys, you know? These days, people are on Instagram all the time, you know? How do you get somebody to notice a medical institution on Instagram or on YouTube? It's not something that's common, but it's something that can be done. And there's a lot of different ways to look at that from a creative strategy standpoint. Something, yeah. something is as as extreme as it, I, you know. I'm I'm assuming you guys have all seen the show Scrubs before, but you know, you guys can you know poke fun at some things and create you know a channel that sort of makes makes uh, pokes light fun at certain aspects of it. Where you know the people that are interested in that content are people that you are attracting. So you know they they won't take it so seriously. It will be more lighthearted and it will be a totally different look for what you guys are trying to achieve. It doesn't always have to be, you know, when you think of medical, uh, you think very serious and very sterile, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be like that. You just have to put the other hat on sometimes. But having lots of video, having lots of photos, making this stuff on a frequent basis from a content standpoint, get your name out there. Same thing like I was saying before, all that content, it, as it gets engaged with, as it get, lo gets looked at, increases the viability of your institution online and through these algorithms so that when people are searching for you at the end of the day you start ranking better people notice you over over the next person over the over this count competitor or that competitor and i think mike by, by what you said you know this content gets consumed mike made a good example to me when we were talking about this about instagram you know you sign on to your favorite instagram account say it's um, you know national geographic and there's a new picture every single day and we swipe through one, two, three, four, five, ten pictures within ten seconds, and then it's old news, and we're not going to go back to that site until they have something new to show us. Um, we just consume content nowadays so quickly that when you put pictures up, someone looks at them, and then when they come back, they want to see something new. Um, like you said, there are certainly things that stay on there forever. Um, you know, your important message from your chair, your you know, your mission statement for the hospital, things like that that shouldn't go away. But this other content, cool pictures. We did this cool uh, splinting lab. We have this great ultrasound. Thing that we did um, and updating those pictures frequently brings people back to your site to see what you're doing. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, a totally great point, Ryan, because, you know, I can't, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to pretend that I could speak very, you know, intelligently about the creative aspects of the medical industry, but, you know, you know, as, as an outsider, you know, uh, you know, th funny things removed from the body, you know, things like that where people would, actually pay attention to um, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. upgrades up to your equipment can only go so far so I'm um, really sort of looking at that type of thing under a different microscope uh, I think it is certainly important um, and and in and in this industry would be an uphill battle but there's a way to do it in a way that would give you guys that robust feeling but also keep a, a, a professional look and, and maintain uh, the level you guys are trying to achieve um, next, I want to talk about quickly. You mentioned Instagram, right? We're talking about that social media and influencers. That's a whole another bucket of of ways that content content gets used. Um, Ryan was talking about Instagram and flipping through things. Um, social media these days um, in the digital world is all all anybody can ever talk about. Um, and making sure that you have social media channels because everybody's on social media. So having a social media channel making sure it's maintained and kept up, that you are interacting with people that have questions. Um, it becomes more and more important uh, every day. Um, people uh, don't text as much as they used to. What they're using are these social media platforms to chat with one another. Um, things like Snapchat, um, things like Instagram. Uh, there are conversations that are happening directly through those platforms um, with people asking, brands for information on where do they buy a product or or how do they get a certain thing um, versus you know emailing contact forms phone calls so social media being out there being visible uh, it's extremely important and the same thing comes with uh, influencers um, in, in our world influencers are, are talked about all of, all of the time um, and these are these are people you know their ages range wildly and there are influential people of a certain thing. And that could be people that are really good with fashion or people that are great influencers in magic. Um, in your case, I am sure that um, if I popped on Instagram right now, there are medical influencers out there, probably doctors that are giving either sage advice about certain things, general things, but I am sure that that is happening. And engaging with these influencers and, you know, and making them 
um, speak to their audiences that uh, clearly uh, a medical influencer is going to have all the people that are interested in medicine um, working with them to sort of, you know, tell people about your institution and why your institution is great. Giving them a reason to speak about it only increases your profile that much more, um, makes everybody aware because the people that are following those people, you know, care what they have to say. And that's why influencers are such a big thing these days. So I'm um, really looking at that in the medical field um, is, is certainly extremely important. So to the people uh, I mentioned earlier, if you look at them, you know, Esther Chu, 55,000 followers on Twitter and Alma Matu, 29,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and they're tweeting stuff out every single day and their institution is plastered all over this stuff. So it's, um, you know, these are highly influential people that we all know that are, um, you know, that are making their brand aware and making their institutions more noticeable to the community. Yeah, Twitter, Twitter is a great example, especially for what you guys are doing. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Instagram and, and Snapchat. Twitter is a great, great platform for you guys. It's a, it's a, it's a way for people to consume information in 140 characters or less. It's little snippets of information. It's backlinks out to articles that are written by, you know, alumni in your institution. It's a really great educational platform. So yeah, I can see why those guys have, you know, have those followers. Um, um, great. Um, where are we? Technology and applications. Yeah, got it. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, looking at how you guys um, digitally are, you know, managing your, your apps and your websites with technology. Um, you know, uh, looking at that in a different way. Uh, you know, how do you guys do your interview application process? How are you guys... Uh, how are you guys handling um, the intake of information? Can you guys do it better? Can you make it more efficient? People these days are you are coming up in these these uh, efficient technological uh, uh, ways where they're used to doing things with you know touching touching their their iPhone so that it unlocks an app or they can pay on our credit card with it. Um, can you guys? look at the techno the technological side of your website of your app you know uh is there an app that needs to be built for you guys where you guys could basically you know build an app to collect all of the information from an interview process uh can people submit to you guys in a different way so really looking at advanced ways to move things from a technological standpoint i think is is extremely important um kaiser permanente uh is, is big out here in, in los angeles and um, I have been very impressed as a patient of theirs and how they have clearly put a lot of effort into the way that they work. Um, I, I just switched over them and being a tech guy myself, I was blown away uh, when I got their app and started using it. So much so that I've never spoken to anybody previously about my healthcare and I can't even tell you how many people I've told about Kaiser. Uh, I, how I'm scheduling my appointments through them I'm getting my billing through their app within an hour. Uh, I did my blood tests and I got my results through my app literally in under five hours. Uh, you know, everything is managed on my phone now. And it's so impressive. And when you can impress people with technology, it, it goes a long way for marketing marketing your, your brand um, in, in your institution. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then, um, so after you guys have all that stuff, uh, you know, you obviously got all your content made, then the advertising component comes in. Um, that's when we're using these personas, uh, you know, to talk to these people. Advertising is all about reaching the right demographic. Uh, and if you guys have done your research, build your base, made the content appropriate for those demographics. And again, the contact can be very different per demographic. I think we were talking about the young Indian male and the, the, the single female, you know, those two messages to those two people should be probably significantly different. Um, so using your personas to target those people um, in, in, in the most appropriate way. Um, one of the things I want to talk about um, on this slide is, uh, is, is Facebook and Google. Um, and, and this in the digital world is something that is, and, and there's tons of articles out there now, especially with this whole Russia and something, it's become, more and more front facing. Um, Mark Zuckerberg was on Capitol Hill because of it. But uh, the thing about Facebook, um, for those that don't know, what Facebook really is, it's an advertising platform. You know, they call it a social network. 
Uh, that's a great job at branding and marketing on their end, but that's not what it is. It's an advertising platform. So 90% of Facebook's revenue comes from advertising dollars that other people are putting into the platform. So brands are buying, you know, obviously in massive quantities, uh, the ability to sell their products online in Facebook. And why that's important from a persona perspective is Facebook's business manager, the back end of Facebook. So what what we do at our company, right, is we advertise things to, to, to these demographics and these people. And if you go into Facebook and you start looking at that stuff, you're able to target people very, very specifically. Um, people's income levels, their ethnicity, their race, their age, what they're into. When you're on Facebook and you're saying that you like this page or this musician or this product, that data is just being collected over and over and over again. It keeps getting collected and, and aggregated, collected and aggregated um, so that people that use their platform to advertise and pay them all their money can use your information to sell you something. Um, that's what Facebook really is, an advertising platform. And the same thing with Google. Um, Google is a search engine and we use Google every day of our lives to do all of our stuff. But same thing, Google is an advertising platform. Um, it is a place where um, Google collects information um, on, on all sorts of things. And then they allow you to then target people um, with particular advertisements. So when you're on whatever web page or news website that you guys are on, there are real estate that is sold um, on a daily basis from Google on that for those web pages. Then people use that real estate and sell different ads on that. So you guys, you, you two, of you and your colleague can both be on the same web page, and you'll see different advertisements because you guys are two different people. Um, and that's how those platforms work. They collect the data, and then they they use that to advertise these things. And the important thing you guys should know about that is when you guys go through this marketing, um, you will be or should be collecting that your the information from your personas so that you can then tell Google how to serve those ads appropriately, and Facebook, how to serve those ads appropriately. We're gonna go over that near the end about Google, uh, you know, Google Analytics and Facebook uh, Business Manager and what it looks like and what types of data you guys can get. So we'll get to that near the tail end. Yeah. Um, the other thing about email uh, about advertising is email marketing. And, and this is a great channel um, and very, very, a very cheap channel to sort of manage. Um, uh, you, you basically should all have an ESP, um, an email service provider, you know, like a, like a MailChimp, which is very common. Um, HubSpot is another one. There's, there's lots of different versions of this. But email marketing is really, really effective um, to manage all of those campaigns that we were talking about, awareness, you know, lead generation, performance. Because if you have an email list of people, and in your case, People, obviously, that you're trying to attract, that you've acquired their, their emails from, or or from you know your your alumni, let's say, um, all of those lists of people um, in these email marketing programs, they become segmented, right? So you start segmenting information by location, by age range. So you can say, I have, you know, I have a hundred thousand emails. And of those 100,000 emails, um, you know, 50% are, are women. Here's this segmentation, and 50% are male. And of those males, uh, you know, these emails here are males that are 25 to 30. And this set down here is males that are 30 to 45, and so on and so forth. And of those, uh, these people live in metropolitan areas. Uh, these other people have, make an income of X or Y. Same thing that you, you know, from like we were talking about before, you have all that data, but what that allows you to do after you segment that stuff is, is start targeting those people properly with different, different automation funnels. Um, you can be sending your alumni reminders about events that are happening only, you know? So if you have a, an email segmentation of your alumni, you can say, hey, we have this, uh, this conference that we're putting on, it's gonna be an hour away from your city. We'd love for you guys to show up and talk to somebody about it. Um, you guys can be requesting donations. You know, you guys can set up a landing page, uh, which, is a, which is a web page that you can direct alumni to, to remind them on a monthly basis to, to you know, put money into it, to, you know, 
uh, try to reach some goal that you guys have set. Um, so it's a really good way from a performance standpoint to try to generate the, the revenue that you guys are seeking. Um, so email is a very cheap and great way to really communicate with a lot of different people and give them a lot of different messaging and try to you know do these different things about you know getting your getting information out there but also collecting revenue. There's a number of different institutions that do this really well. You know, Maryland does it really well with their alumni pushing out information, procedural videos, things like that all the time. Uh, Cincinnati does it really well as well. We started using MailChimp here to, to email our alumni about conference updates and conference data and pushing them information. And one of my chief residents that did it actually got sick for about a month. And so she hadn't been doing it. And I got emails from about 15 of my alumni like, hey, where's the conference email? I really like the updates that you guys are sending me. I, I like the links. Um, and I didn't even notice they weren't going out. So it is, um, it's a powerful thing. It's something that's instantly noticed by the alumni once you start pushing them information and then you can start asking them for stuff in return. Right. Um, I, I, Ryan, I think we can get this. We kind of talked about this earlier, but um, yeah, just re re one. yeah, reiterating the power of Instagram and influencers. Um, uh, the other thing I want to talk about in the advertising world is uh, there's basically two types of of advertising from a digital standpoint. There's organic and then there is paid media. Um, organic really comes from uh, just what it says, the, the ability for people to naturally know and learn about your institution. Um, there's a common thing out there that a lot of people talk about on the digital side of things, which is called SEO, uh, which stands for search engine optimization, um, which is an organic tactic. And essentially what that is, is and I was talking about this earlier, creating relevant content um, about your institution so that when people uh, are searching for, uh, you know, the best ultrasound institution, um, if you have relevant content about that that's being published on a regular basis, what's going to happen is when people are searching in the search engine for those things, you are going to score higher and get ranked higher. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, also, the idea of backlinks, and we we're talking about this in PR. Having links to your website all over the internet feed into that algorithm. So those type of things, backlinks and content creation, um, become very relevant from, a, from an organic standpoint. Organic is simply I, as a as a person interested in your institution, naturally go and search you out. The other version of that um, is paid media. And that has a lot to do with what we were talking about before, which is paying people, paying Facebook, paying Google to push out your advertising efforts. Um, so that is things like, uh, you know, getting content in front of these people on, on these certain channels. One of the things that more specifically that I want to talk about for you, with you guys from a search perspective, because I'm search for you guys is where everything's at is, is is Google and how, how Google works from a keyword standpoint when we're talking about search engines. So when you type in whatever you guys type into Google, there's a whole back platform called Google AdWords. And what Ad, AdWords is, is essentially a stock market of bidding. So the things that you see on that page are not just happenstance. People, companies, agencies like mine are paying money on keywords to place those higher in the ranking system. So Google has a real time bidding system all of the time where, where these people are saying, I wanna, I'll pay this much for this word in these hours on these days. And that's how those words then get placed when they, in combinations, when they get placed within the search engine. So again, we're talking about advertising dollars through Google, that's what's happening, right? It's a big part of it. So all of the things you're searching in there are ranking based on some institution paying for that. So Google takes a lot of, of, of things into account with their algorithm. So uh, let's say that you're in Rochester and you look up, you know, best medical institution. Uh, UCLA is not going to show up on, on that ranking. It will understand your demographic and your location. So it will be localized to, you know, the Rochester area. That being said, if you were so, you know, brazen, you could, if you you were UCLA, actually pay an extreme amount of money in that area to show UCLA in the ranking. So 
Um, while it naturally on the algorithm won't do that, I could pay it out my nose to say show UCLA in when you type in best medical institutions but, and when you're in Rochester, UCLA could be the number one ranked thing. So that you, there's a lot of money to be spent in that category. But the other thing that's interesting is a lot of people bid on keywords against each other. So if we use UCLA as, as an example in LA, USC and UCLA are bidding on each other's keywords all the time. So that when you type in uh, you know, if you type in UCLA, USC Medical School, UCLA is probably bidding on those keywords so that their company, their, their institution, UCLA, shows up ahead of those other ones. So I, I don't know that they're doing that, but they could be doing that. That's the point. So there's a lot of manipulation going on with dollars on the back end of those search engines. And that's, again, all this paid media. Hey, Mike, one second before you go past that incredibly creepy factoid. Um, <laughs> The uh, so is that an open market with with like an exchange where you can see the value of different terms or words, or or is it um, uh, proprietary where their preferred customers that perhaps have greater purchase power? Um, no, it, it, that's a great question. It, it's an open market, so as long as you have the money, it will they they will accept it. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. All right. We're almost there, guys. We've got about 10 minutes, so we're going to do data analytics, and we'll take some questions, and we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for, for bearing with me here. Um, so data analytics. Um, so we've talked a bit about this as we've kind of gone through this, this presentation, but um, after you know, now that you've got your brand strategy, now that you've got your content, the really key component is then understanding the data that's being provided, right? So um, like we talked about on the front end, um, there is so much data being collected on everybody all of the time. Um, you know, anybody that uses anything digital, um, the reality of the situation is, uh, you know, lots of people know lots of things about you, where you are, what you like, um, so on and so forth. So um, there's two ways that, that data analytics become useful. Um, we were talking about Facebook Manager before. Um, but that's on, on the front end from a Facebook standpoint. We were talking about those those targeting options. So, Ryan, I don't know if you want to open that up. Yeah, let me see if I can get it to work here. You guys all see that okay? So this is the, uh, the Facebook audience tool, they call it. And like I was saying before, uh, this is just reiterating. So if I go into Facebook as an advertiser, um, and this is what, what we do at my agency all the time, um, I'm going in here and I'm selecting all of these things, right? Location, education, finance, ethnicity, friends of friends, home. So the, the sort of intricate level that this goes into is, uh, is mind boggling of how detailed this can be to really hyper target, you know, those people that you want. So this is where dollars are getting spent on, on, on the front end of things, you know? Um, again, again, this is with Facebook. Um, and, you know, the Google has their own component to it as well, all of the, all of the channels do. Um, but you're getting really, really specific on, on how target. Now you can start to really understand why Facebook is such a behemoth um, of a company in general because it's so powerful as a tool. Um, so, you know, you guys can target your personas um, in that. Google Analytics is the back end of things. So, uh, this is this is just a dashboard, of, a data visualization um, that we use, and what this is telling me is who's responding to my stuff, right? And that's the other powerful thing, right? I might be able to target things, but we, you know, when we do this, you target lots of different things. You, you don't get it right the first time, or maybe even the, the eighth time or the tenth time. You know, you you go through these iterations until you really hone in on on what's working, and then you really expand from there. And what Google Analytics is doing on, on, in this case is showing me that. You know, who's opening my stuff? Who's looking at my stuff? What are the click-through rates? You know, who's who, what what ads are they clicking on? This ad or that ad? You know, how many ads do I have running? Um, what are the type of people doing it? Are they are they married? Are they single? Um, so it's really aggregating all that data into these display dashboards to sort of give you the information you need to do analyze it and then adjust from there, um, which we call an optimization process. Um, so these are just different these are just different dashboards of how you display that data but the important part about it is you know as you're spending money in the on these channels um whether it be any of these or other ones 
Um, the value comes in understanding, understanding the data, doing the data analysis, and then optimizing and adjusting. Um, that's the important and key part of it. Is this piece of content working? Well, we shot this video of this doctor talking about this thing, and we also shot this, well, who's a male, and then we also shot the same video of a female. What are people responding to more, the male or the female? Oh, they respond to the female more? Well, great, then let's make more female videos. Um, you know, things like that. And, and that's, how, that's how all of these teams use this information because then dollars that are being spent for advertising become much more optimized. Uh, the dollar goes a lot farther when you know, A, on the front end who your audience is, and B, on the back end, how those audiences are responding properly. Can we talk about that? Yeah, exactly. Got to keep targeting them. Um, how do I use this data? So uh, there's a couple things. I talked a little bit about uh, hyper targeting, um, and this 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 takes time. But like I said, it's it's kind of like re redoing your demographic layout um, and in your targeting over and over again until you find out real that really specific thing about the people that are responding to ads. And when you're in these programs, you can set up a multitude of different campaigns. It's not just one thing that gets set up. You know, when we're running our campaigns, for example, for our brands, now we're setting up 10, 20, 30, 40 different campaigns that are running at the same time. And those 40 things are all geared towards different people. And so they're all saying different things. Um, some of them I might show the, the woman video first, and then I might show them a, a photo of a male doing something or vice versa. So you kind of rearrange your content um, across the board um, to really hyper target and figure that out. Um, it says cookies up here. Cookies uh, are, are again, a, a thing that we all live with and we probably don't even know. Um, cookies are, are a digital imprint on web pages. And the way that marketers use this stuff, uh, digital marketers use this stuff, is once you go to a web page, I've got you. I know that you've been there. And then once I have you and know that you've been there, I can then use that to target you with other information over and over again. So. Uh, one of the things that, that I like to use as an example here is if any of you have recently looked or shopped for a shoe or a, a, a hat or some clothes or, you know, something on Amazon, I guarantee you, um, you have seen another photo of that, you know, on, you know, the New York Times uh, when you're when you're reading that an article there or when you're on Facebook, because what happens is. I know that you've been there. I know that you were interested in this thing. So then I can keep serving you all throughout the internet, all sorts of different information about that thing that you came to look at. I can determine the amount of time you can see that you, I can say, follow this person around for an hour or follow this person around for 12 days or, or a year, um, depending on what my budget is and how much, how important I think it is to find you to, to get to buy this thing. And, and where that's important with you guys, is the same thing from an informational standpoint, right? How often you want, if you're doing brand awareness and, so, and you want people to know about your institution, well, maybe if they come to your website, you know, you want to make sure that they, every time they go somewhere else, they're, they're like, oh, yeah, there's this thing that I looked at. They're awesome. I like that. I like what they have to say. And it's keep saying it's in front of their face all the time. The point of marketing is, is it's, a, it's, a, it's a long play always. How many times you got to get something in front of somebody before they have the intent to purchase or the intent to sign up or apply um, in this case? Um, and then uh, uh, this is what retargeting does, you know, with these cookies is, is this whole thing. So, um, that, sorry, that process is called retargeting. Once you have the cookie, then you, then you retarget these people with specific information over and over and over again until they come back. So that is, uh, that is my quick run through, uh, sprint through uh, as much as I could give you guys. Uh, I know you guys all have busy lives and limited time. Thanks, Mike. That was, you know, that was outstanding. So um, we're open to any questions. Also, I know we're kind of limited on time. Keel, if you want to take a couple of questions now, but also I put Mike's um, email or I put his uh, <clears throat> website address on the front page. If you guys have any further questions for him or specifics about, you know, a question pertaining to you, he'd be happy to take some emails too um, and, you know, respond to you guys and let you know what his opinion are on, on certain things. Yeah, Ryan, you can feel free to share my, my email with everybody too if they want to just, you know, go go direct. Um, that's totally fine. I'm happy to happy to answer anything. I know that was fast. <laughs> Great. Any questions at the moment about any of that? I know it's a lot of content that we went through in a in a short period of time, um, and you know, lots to take in. I have one. 
Uh, but uh, anybody else in the class real quick? All right. Um, <clears throat> first off, th thank you both. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Brothers on two different coasts, you guys actually start sounding more and more alike as the, pr as the presentation went on. Uh, but you both talk really fast. Um, <laughs> let's see here. A long time ago, I guess like 40 minutes ago, uh, there was a mention around public relation uh, information. And the, you could pay for this or you could do it for free. Um, something we've talked about uh, throughout this curriculum is how all of us are dealing with, uh, I, I think in, in advertising land, uh, Mike, you'd probably think these are ridiculously tiny budgets to work with. Um, if you can give us some examples of, of effective free PR uh, that Something like, and Ryan, you could fill us in. What, what, would a, what would that look like from a, a residency, uh, where you're not having to pay for a bunch of content on a site, uh, expensive video stuff? How do you get a message uh, that you're doing good things and your PR is top notch out without breaking your bank? I think you know, Mike could probably comment on that more specifically. I think the best people to give you free PR are your alumni and your current faculty members. If they are doing amazing things and already putting it out there with their label attached to you, that's the best PR you can get. So word of mouth from your alumni, pushing them information, having them, you know, give presentations nationally, having them be national thought leaders, um, as well as people that are currently working in your institution doing the same thing. You know, that is, you know, although you're paying them as an employee, all that is free public relations for you that says, hey, we have thought leaders in X at our institution. Um, and people are going to see that and they're going to come check it out. And I think that's the best way to get any sort of free PR out of it is to train really outstanding people and have them become leaders in, in the field and either stay with your institution or, you know, become alumni that are going to propagate that throughout the country. And that's totally free and something that they're going to do anyways to become expertise and your name is attached to it. So that's, you know, that's one of the best ways to get some free public relations out there. Yeah, I have a question for you. It's Robert Levine. Um, Related to what Kiel just said, uh, it, it this is a lot of work to do properly and to do well. And I'm wondering how many departments have somebody professional doing it for them versus seat of the pants having people who enjoy working on social media or having your residents do it and hope that it comes out well because they they generally do a good job, but they're not they're not really marketing professionals like you guys. So what do you say to that? Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I have a brother that's on this that is a marketing expert, and I can't get a budget to pay him to help me with stuff um, through my institution, which is, you know, because this is expensive stuff and it takes, you know, there's there's limited amount of funds for anything. Um, so it is really challenging to get the effective marketing budget to do um, really incredible things. But, you know, as we went through this presentation, there are a number of things that you can do locally, you know, making your website good, utilizing you know, we have a lot of young people in our institutions that are really good at IT and really good at social networking and social media, using your chief residents, using your young faculty members, um, and kind of creating maybe even a task force or a committee that's, you know, use a lot, utilizes these platforms already that are going to start pushing content out for you. But it is, I totally agree, uh, Robert, that this is really challenging. It takes a lot of time and to do in a really robust manner can take a lot of money that oftentimes academic institutions don't have. Like, I don't know if you have any comments on that of, of um, you know, from a financial standpoint, when, you know, when people come to you with limited budgets, what you recommend. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's totally a fair point. And Ryan, I think you did a great job kind of elaborating upon that. I mean, you know, uh, it's like anything, you know, th th things unfortunately cost money because there's a lot of, you know, humans that have to kind of, you know, execute this stuff. But and when you sort of localize it like that, uh, Ryan, your suggestions about the team, I mean, uh, I think that's you guys should take that, you know, you know, to heart because you're right. You know, kids these days grow up on these platforms and these networks. Right. So and, and I got and I don't know how you can get them to do certain things. But if you can create an environment where, you know, you get somebody to run a social media channel on, on your residency program, that's great. I don't know if that's a thing you guys can do, but anything that you guys can have them doing in house is 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 great i mean but you've got to find the right people to do that they want to be doing that in their time um and, and, and as far as the pr goes uh Keel, like you were talking about i mean ryan again you hit the nail right on the head you know you leveraging your alumni is uh, so key in this 
Um, having a blog post on your website is great. You know, somewhere somewhere where you're publishing information about your institution um, uh, is certainly helpful just from that organic standpoint that we were talking about as opposed to the paid. Um, it, it's, it's tremendously helpful. The problem is on, on a PR level, when you're talking about real PR, you're talking about expensive stuff. I mean, that stuff, <laughs> That stuff really costs a lot of money, the PR aspect of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that anything from a PR standpoint is particularly free. It's more of this organic thing, which is having the people that you can trust write, you know, white papers, evergreen content. Um, um, that's certainly important. Uh, but if nobody's, if nobody is seeing it, obviously, you know, it kind of goes on deaf ears. But uh, uh, I would, I would say having a team. Um, of residents manage social channels, uh, talk about it. having your alumni white papers. That stuff is all very, very important from you know becoming you know keeping the thought leadership going. You know, it's it's interesting. I um I was thinking about <laughs> what I just asked and the way that uh, Ryan answered it, and I, I started thinking about our frustration around you know we don't as individual programs have a large marketing budget. But looking at the the folks that are on here right now. I guarantee you each one of your institutions has a, a fairly large marketing purse. It's just not controlled where we'd like to see the control. So you have to use, a, um, I won't say manipulation, but maybe a little, little change management, a little negotiation to perhaps make those people value what you're offering. Um, I uh, uh, was just pondering, like, okay, other forms of free PR, uh, it, it occurred to me, I. I have a resident, he's uh, unfortunately graduated this year, so I'm gonna miss that guy. Uh, that we recruited in, we're counting it up, he's been on the front page of our paper five different times uh, in his two and a half years. Yes, he's a, he's a good looking dude, but he's also in situations that the institution and evidently our local paper seem to value, so natural settings. He has a, um, a relationship with this photographer that he made organically. Uh, but then our marketing VP kind of got hold of it and was like, you know, Nate, what are you doing this weekend? We just had a big snow and it's Nate and two other residents uh, on, on the mountain that's right outside our hospital. Um, I, it's difficult to get in there uh, to talk to the people that have their fingers in the purse strings, but demonstrating value in your department and that we actually have a fairly photogenic uh, specialty uh, can can work wonders for you. Um, I think the other thing. And Ryan, I don't know if you use this or Mike, if you have an opinion, uh, harnessing the expertise that's in your department. We do a, uh, most of the front facing for our hospitals. I mean, we certainly do at a patient level. What about our expertise? I mean, our toxicologists, we have an opioid crisis. The guys in the office next door to me, Paul Stromberg, he's on, on the news, it seems like every other week, talking about something around opioids. Um, our chair, talks about social disparities in our area, as well as Jack Perkins, another one of my, my colleagues. We have stuff that is digestible by the public and putting that out there, it may be just in a, a sort of a local environment, but when you Google my institution, those things pop up. They seem to go to the top of the search engine and it's our department time after time that seems to hit. I don't know if that's uh, something you've seen elsewhere or if that's just... Yeah, I totally agree. What's what's hot in the media, what's hot in the news, you know, gun violence, stay in your own lane, opioid crisis, all these things are nationally recognized terms and things that are happening. And if you have someone in your institution that is working on that, publishing on that, an expert in that, getting that information out there to the public is incredibly important and also something that is relatively, I don't think easy is the right word, but easier than it would be if it wasn't a national problem. So they're speaking of opioid crisis every day in the national news, and you just did a 50% opioid reduction in your ED. Go tell the newspaper that. Put that out on PR. Have your toxicologist go talk about their suboxone clinic or whatever they're doing. Um, you know, you're trying to reduce gun violence, and you have this, um, you know, EMS person that's a gun violence expert, and they've been publishing papers on it. Put that out there. This is, you know, the stuff that's out there and sexy in the news right now and people care about is the things that are more easily accepted and easy to push out to the to the public relations people and sometimes they don't know that we're doing this stuff uh, until you tell them like oh wow you're doing great stuff yes let's you know let's put this on the front page of the website for the whole institution let's you know get the, the local media in here to do a quick uh, spot on you things like that because if it's nationally important it's going to be more acceptable to put on the local news as well 
Yeah, I think that those are great points on, on both your sides. I mean, the great thing about what you guys do for the world is you, you help people and um, lots of people need help all the time. And so, uh, you know, in, other, in, in that regard, Ryan and, and, and Kiel, what you guys are talking about, other people will pay for your PR if you're helping, right? Some other institution is gonna pay for your PR to make their, their, their city, you know, their stuff look, look good. So, um, you know, being thought leaders and, and use it, leveraging your in-house team for that, I think is, is a great idea. And, and you, know, you know, going and doing things and helping people, you know, the news is gonna pick that up and cover that. So uh, I'm sure there are good ways to help your communities uh, across the board as a team, as individuals that will, you know, put a spotlight on, on, on your institutions in those cases. Anybody else have in the class have a have a question or a comment while we're uh, in our waiting moments here? Thank you. I don't really have a question, but I really appreciate this talk, and I just wanted to say how scared I am after I listened to this entire talk about the social media and how I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm not on any websites that might <laughs> resemble Facebook. It's amazing when after you know talking to Mike about all this stuff. I mean, you know, they he's like they know everything about you. They know where you're clicking. They are targeting you and selling you things. I was buying a, I was telling him I was buying a pair of earmuffs for my son. We were going to this monster truck thing that he likes, and I bought it online as I was in the store. And I went home, and it was literally I signed on to Facebook to do something, and it was right there front page those earmuffs on a different site. You know, we're selling these earplugs for X, Y, and Z. It was I was like, holy cow! And my wife and I freaked out a little bit. You, you hit on something that's really scary, which is it's not what you're clicking on while you're on the computer, but I've received ads less than 10 minutes after I walked out of the store mm -hmm. and paid yeah, me they, they, card rather yeah. than cash, and I've gotten ads about related things. It's astounding how the people are selling you data. It's not any different, of course, than pharmacies that have been selling physician data for decades. Yeah, they have beacon tracking. You know, they know where you are, so it's... Uh... It's something that everybody kind of, I guess, has to accept at some point. But yeah, um, yeah, your information is out there. We were, we live in a digital world. Guys, thank you. This was very useful and, and helpful in how you make the connections at the different aspects of marketing and and the related activities. Thanks so much. Of course, my pleasure. And sorry I talked so fast. I, there's there's so much to cover. <laughs> Thanks for taking your time. It was really helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. I'll, uh, I'll send Mike's email out so you guys have it. Um, you know his his email address in case you guys have any specific questions um, that he could you know give you know give yeah. some expertise to. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer anything you guys have offline as well. Yeah, please feel free. I'm I'm more than happy to talk about anything or or, or sort of enlighten you more on on any of the specifics. I know it was rushed. Or scary more. <laughs> yeah, scary more exactly. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Sure. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night. Deanna, do I need to do anything from my side or you're just, just disconnect?